One of the most amazing things that we as Christians can do is to, uh, is to praise God. And we praise Him not because of what He does for us. We need to learn to praise God because He's God. Because He deserves our worship. Because we deserve our praise. It seems like sometimes we act as if God needs to earn our worship. How he needs to do something for us so that we then can do something for him. And we forget that he is God all powerful and he deserves our worship continuously. Not just when he does something good for us. Not just when he blesses us in the way that, that we want him to, to bless us. Not just uh, when, when we receive something. But the idea of worshiping God because he is God is something that has been forgotten. Because we always tend to, to mix praise and worship with blessings. And, 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 and we forget the idea that God, he is the creator. He is the one who, who, who is our God. He made us and, and, and he made us with the purpose that we may worship him. We learned this week as we did our midweek service about praising him in the most difficult times. And we talked about praising him, you know, when Paul and Silas were, were in prison. And, you know, and, and, and in the middle of the prison, they were praising him. And we, and we learned that their praise, their praise made the ground shake, made the firmaments shake, took their chains off, and opened doors. That's what praise does. That's what praise does in the middle of difficulties, in the middle of the storm, in the middle of issues, in the middle of, of problems. And that's why we come to church, to praise Him no matter what's going on. And out of, at a lot of times, out of suffering and pain, we must, we must learn to bring out that praise. And not exalt the negative that's going on in our lives, but exalt the greatness of God exalt who he is and praise him praise him no matter what's going on in our lives let us bow our heads for prayer dear heavenly father we thank you so much for your blessings and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to just be here Lord and to and to praise you today as a church, we have come here. You have called us out. You have called us to, to worship you. You have called us out, Lord, to come together as a group to worship you and to, and to praise your name. And I ask, Lord, that you may speak to us this morning. We ask, Lord, that you may lead us in the study of your word that you may lead us in how we as a church should be and how we should preach this gospel to the world that we, we participate and we live in today. That you may give us the wisdom and understanding. We thank you, Lord. And we ask that your Holy Spirit may be present here in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning I was very... Uh, Happy to see a, a friend from a long time, Jose, for being here today. Uh, we've known each other for about, it's been, I was thinking about it, it's been like 40 years, <laughs> you know. That's a long time. And, uh, and saw him here today. I see him during, during the week sometimes and just glad that he was able to be here, be here today. We have a few people that are missing in our church. They're uh, traveling a little bit, taking advantage of the summer and traveling. Um, so we ask that God will take care of them and bring them back safely. And uh, hopefully they're able to join our service from far away here today. 
Today's title of the sermon is about growing big and growing small. Growing big and growing small. You know, when we think about church, we think of a family church, and, and a lot of times we, we look at our church and we, and, we, and we really like our family church, you know, because we all know each other, and we're able to come, and we have lunch every Saturday, and we love this family church. So a lot of times when we, when we see a small church like, like ours, we sort of like this. Because it's small and we, and we enjoy the fraternity and we enjoy the love and we enjoy the community and we enjoy all these things. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go to a big church. I want to go to a, to a small church because it's so cozy and it's so nice. But then we have to ask ourselves, is that what God wants? Does God want us to keep small because it serves our need? It serves what I want. It keeps my friends, you know. And is that, is that the purpose of God? Is that really what God wants or does God want us to grow? Does God want the kingdom of God to grow? And a lot of times we have to be careful of that mentality because a lot of times we can grow so, we can become so comfortable in our own situation because where we worship and how we worship just serves my needs and my needs are being met without understanding that we are called to preach this gospel. We are called to, to go out there and let other people know of the love of Jesus Christ. So the the issue becomes the issue of growth and what is what happens when you grow and a lot of times people are afraid of that growth because they 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 sort of lose the things that they that they have and and they they, they're really not interested in growing but what happens is that in everything in life that doesn't grow dies Anything that doesn't grow, anything that doesn't experience transformation is either sick or dies. One of the two. So as a church, if we as a church stay small all the time, we are either sick or we are going to die. One of the two. So the issue of growth is essential for the church because it is essential for a child. Imagine if you have a baby and 10 years later, the baby is still crawling and the baby is still the same size. At that point, 10 years later, it'd be good to figure out that there might be something wrong with that baby. And the same thing is with a church. When a church stays the same size for too long, it is a sign that it's not fulfilling its commission. It is a sign that it's not doing what Christ asked the church to be. In other words, it is a sign that the church just created a place that's very comfortable. Everyone here worships the same. Everyone loves each other. Everyone believes the same things. And we, and we become comfortable in this little pocket that we get to come every Sabbath to. And we're able to just enjoy people who believe just like we do, think just like we do. And, and we're able to enjoy that. What happens to that mentality that it will die? It will die. In church, a church must grow numerically. And I know a lot of times it says, well, numbers aren't everything. Uh, they're not everything, but they're something. They're not everything, but it's something. A church must also grow spiritually. If you're going to a church, we as a church, you, you have to be spiritually uh, higher. You must, must grow spiritually. You must be closer to God. You, there must be transformation in your life as you are there. If not, church is not going on. Though through Christianity, through time, Christianity has become an individual thing. 
where, where church is an event that we attend. And when we attend that event, we feel like we've done our duty. Because we go and we attend an event. Nothing really happens there. Nothing really happens to us. Something happens there where, where beautiful music is set up and, and a sermon is put. But really nothing happens from, nothing happens within us. And, and the purpose of the kingdom is to, is to grow the kingdom, is to, is to get the church to grow. And it's not just to get origin to grow. We have to think about growing the kingdom of God. A lot of times we need to see that there's more to church. There has to be a lot more to church than just coming here on Saturdays and listening to music and listening to a sermon. One of the things that origin, we always talked about origin, why we call this church origin is because we, we want to go back to what Jesus taught. We want to go back to the origin. We want to go back to what Jesus intended church to be. For this reason, for all this, the, the purpose to, to, to happen, for the purpose of church to happen, we as a church must grow large and we must grow small. What does that mean? See, when, we, when church talks about growth... It talks about, you know, if we, if we grow too big, then we're going to lose this camaraderie we have. We won't be able to have the garden of prayer anymore. Okay, imagine if we have 300 people here, a garden of prayer would take three hours. Amen. Okay, so, so we say, okay, then we can't have the garden. Or, or we say, well, we can't have lunch anymore. Uh, or, or we can't do these things. And you'd be surprised how many churches... Don't grow because of that mentality of they're afraid to lose the little things that they have. In other words, if the church grows, Joe and Joan one day are going to come in here and somebody's going to be sitting in that seat. That's a problem. You know, as church people, imagine Elky, somebody takes your seat. Oh my goodness. You know, somebody takes your seat and the seat that we usually have that we sit in, you know, you walk into church and there's somebody sitting there. There's a problem. And believe me, I experienced that. Uh, and uh, I, won't, I won't say the name because we've got people on Facebook from other place watching. But I, had a, I was in a church a long time ago. And, and, and it was, it, you know, it was Sabbath school. You know, when it used to be a 915. You guys remember that 915? All you 1130 people, you know? Okay. Remember that? All right. Used to be 915. Okay. And I was in church 915. And, and you know, 915, just like here at 1115, there were only like six people here, you know. And because 1115 is too early. Okay. So anyway, in the same way, it, it used to be 915, all right. It used to be 915. And at 915, somebody walks in. Somebody walks in. There were only like six people in the whole church. So I'm standing there, and, and this person walks up to me and says, Pastor, I got a little problem I need you to solve. Okay, it was a whole church. 98% of the benches were empty. But there's two visitors had come. And they had sat in a specific place. So the sister came up to me and said, Pastor, I got a problem. Somebody sitting in my seat. Can you please tell them <laughs> that that's my seat? I said, sister, well, I'll tell you what. See, that one you paid for with your tithe. I'm going to give you another one for free. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. This one is free. So what you're going to do today is you're going to sit this one. This is a free seat. But the thing is that a lot of times we don't like change. We don't like what growth does. 
I mean, when our children grow, we got to buy them new clothes. When our children grow, then we have to like think of a car. When our children grow, then we have to think of a car insurance. When a Christian, so, so there is pain to growing. There is pain to growing, but a lot of times, but at the same time, do we want them to grow? Yes, we want them to grow, but there is pain to growing. And a lot of times we say, well, I wish my children would stay small. No, you wouldn't. Because <laughs> if they would stay small, then they were sick. Then they have a problem. You see the same struggle that happens with growth and with change? And the, the, same, the thing is that the same thing happens with, with church. And a lot of times for a church to grow, we have to be uncomfortable. We have to get out of our box. We need to do things that are different and we need to get involved in different ways and we have to get our, out of our box for things to happen and, 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 and it's interesting how much we are willing to do for financial growth how much we are willing to do for educational growth how much we are willing to do for these things but yet how little a lot of times we are willing to do for spiritual growth things that have to do for eternity so what do successful churches do successful churches that are being used in an amazing way for the kingdom of God see we Here's, here's a, a pill that we've been given, a lot of us, for many years. Is that, here's the pill we've been given. We've been taught that maybe we don't grow as much because we have the truth. And that since a lot of people don't like truth then they don't come to our church and it's so we actually feel good that we're not growing it's almost like well we are the little flock we are the little ones and 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 because we have so much truth that's why we're not growing see we've been given that little pill I want to let you know that the early church grew in a powerful way. Yes. Yes. Are you going to tell me they didn't have truth? They grew in a powerful way. But sometimes we, we're giving this pill about that because we have so much truth and because we have things, that's the reason why no one wants to come to church instead of looking within and saying, what are we, do, what are we doing wrong that's not creating growth? What are other churches doing that's creating growth? That's creating people to come to know Jesus. And a lot of times our ego gets a little big. We have this big ego that doesn't allow us to learn from other things, from other people. That doesn't allow us to learn of when, when, of from what other churches are doing. And it's not that these churches are doing anything new. They're just being biblical. And we don't like the fact that other people being, may be being more biblical than we are. We must grow big. And we must grow small. What does that mean? That we must grow big in size and people coming. But at the same time, we must be able to create groups, small groups in church. Where the same thing that we do here on Saturdays where we pray for each other. And, and we spend time knowing each other's problems and difficulty doesn't change. Because we're able to create cell groups and homes that are going on. Where all these things, where these cell groups get together. They pray together. They, they know each other's requests. They know each other's problems. They pray for each other. They do all of that goes on. On, and, and then when you come to church, well, let, let me tell you what. Do you remember when we had prayer in the different homes? Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Do you remember how that felt? Yes, sir. See, that's an experience 
The churches that are growing never change. It is not an event for them. It is the way they do church. It's not something they do for one week. It's not something that they do for a month. It is not an event. The idea of cell groups is something that they do continuously because that is where transformation, that is where a prayer happens. That is where spiritual growth happens. And when that happens, do you remember when we prayed for a whole week? Do you remember how the Sabbath felt? Do you remember that? No one came in, no one came in here with an empty tank. Everybody came to worship with a full tank. And what happens is when that doesn't happen, we come to church on Saturday and we hear the praise and worship and we hear this. And then by the end of the service, our tank gets full and then we go home. And during the week, that needle begins to just move closer to empty. And then we walk in here with an empty tank. But if we were to get together during the week to study the word of God and to come together and to pray for each other and eat together. Yes, the church got together and they ate together. They studied together. They prayed together and they created that. Well, when they came to church, let me tell you something. The worship experience is completely different. It's different when live people are worshiping than when dead people are worshiping. It's just a little different. It's just a little different. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And the thing is that, that when you, you see, see in the life that we, let me tell you something, people. We get so closed into our little churches and our little groups and we don't see what other people are doing. And sometimes we think, well, pastor, if we start getting together also in homes, that's like too much. Well, let me tell you something. There are people just like you in this world today that work just as much as you that are doing that every week, getting together in homes and studying the word of God. Not from 2,000 years ago. I mean, it's happening right now today. But you know why they do this? Because these people find that spiritual growth is essential and is more important than their jobs is more important than anything in their life and they do it it's happening right now oh uh life is too fast paced today no you just don't want to do it but wait till one of your children gets sick you're gonna have time then what to your wife or your husband can say, oh, you're going to have time then. And, and, the, and the thing is that these things are happening right now around us. We can't, we can't be left behind. We cannot be left behind. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, let, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. See, church is not just about listening to the word of God. Church has to do with caring for one another. You can't care about one another if you don't know about one another. You can't pray for one another if you don't know the difficulties that are going with with one another. This idea that we have that churches, me go, fake like everything is okay. You know, what is what is the biggest lie that we ever say? You know what the biggest lie we ever say when somebody tells things going, we saw things going real good. That's the biggest lie we say. Most of the time it's a lie. It's not. But we don't have the environment to be able to say, my life stinks. I'm going through a lot of stuff. I'm still going to praise God, but I'm going through problems in my life because we are supposed to fake it till we make it. 
Somehow we, 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 we've taught ourselves and taught others that Christianity is all about acting like things are going good. No, we as Christians suffer. We go through pain. We go through all of these things together. And the thing is, we need to create the environment at our church that we actually care for one another. And we do that. And that is not going to happen. The minute you have a group of over 20 or 30, that's not going to happen anymore. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, when he came, he's, he dedicated three and a half years to working with 12. Isn't it interesting? To working with 12 people. And he concentrated on these 12 people. And with this 12 people, he, he, he started the greatest movement in history. Yes. The greatest movement in history. He says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good, to stir up love and good works. We, we stir that up within each other. We stir that up within each other. We stir love. We stir good love. We motivate each other to good works. We motivate each other to serve. We motivate each other to make a difference in the world. And, and for church, it's supposed to be that we, we, we do that for each other. We don't just come and listen. Church has to do with each other, not just you and me as a pastor. You and the church leadership has to do with each other. Involved with each other. Getting involved with each other. Each other's pain. Each other's suffering. And and and. and and the thing is, we, we are afraid as church people, we've come to the point where we are afraid of letting people know our secrets and our struggles. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to know each other's secrets and each other's struggles and each other's issues to help each other. Not to judge each other, but to help each other. But since, since it doesn't happen often enough, you think that you're the only one struggling. Oh, if we were to sit here, people, and start to learn. If we were to sit here right now and go one by one, what each person here is struggling with sin. What each of us is struggling with pain and suffering. The minute we start down the line, everybody's going to start talking because everyone's going to know they're not the only ones. But a church like this, this even this big, it's not, it, it, it's, it's not right for, it, it won't happen this big. It happens in smaller groups. That's why Jesus started with 12 disciples. He didn't start with a congregation of 500. So we, we, that needs to happen. In church, that needs to happen. Then it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Oh, man, you guys know I've been fighting this, this internet church. <laughs> you know I've been fighting this since the first day. And still fight. Because that's okay for people who are sick. Okay? But church, we must come together. And I'll stick to that. And I won't change on that. It says, coming together. Coming together. Seeing each other. Talking to each other. Understanding each other. Putting ourselves in each other's situation. See, people, a lot of times we, we don't listen to each other's story. We don't have the opportunity to listen to each other's story. And we all have a story. And if you ever sit down and you listen to someone's, where they were born, who their parents were, what kind of struggles they had. 
See, if we would know each other's stories, we would treat each other differently. But we don't know each other's story. You know what we know? A little box that every Christian is supposed to be in. And we try to fit everybody inside that little box. But when you see someone act in a certain way or going through certain things, and then you sit down and you listen to the story, how they were given up as a child. How in their whole life they never experienced someone give them a hug or a kiss. How they were thrown from home to home. You see people, when, when you hear stories like that, and then you see that older person in church act in a certain way, now you understand why. But you see, we don't know each other's stories. All we know is how I think you should act as a Christian. But we don't know each other's stories. Because we don't create the moment for that to happen. If we knew, and, and, and you, you, you yourself have experienced it, when you have gotten close to a church member, and you have been able to talk, and you have been able to learn their story, hasn't your attitude changed towards them? Everything changes towards that person anymore. Everything changes towards that person. Because now you know their story. That happens when we come together. But exhorting one another. See, it's not the pastor doing this. It's not the preacher doing this. Constantly you see in the New Testament one another. One another. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see, as you see the day approaching. In other words, as we see the second coming and as we see the end of the world, the closer we must become to one another. The closer we must come to one another. In Hebrews also 13 3.13, chapter 3, verse 13, says, but exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Listen to this. How do we keep each other from sin? People, church is not a competition on who's holiest. I don't know if you knew that. It's not a competition of who's holier. Church is a place where we should be able to be open about our sins. And again, I repeat, it's why we don't have, it's why we don't have membership in origin. Because no matter what you do, if you know it, I can't kick you out because you're, there's no membership. Amen. No matter what you do. This church can never kick you out. This church can never ask you to not come because whatever sin you've committed, because we don't have membership. Your membership, if you come to origin, your membership is in heaven as a body, as part of the body of Christ. And if Christ don't kick you out, who are we to do that? And we've been in a situation where you see where churches, uh, you know, they feel they're, 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 they're you know, a, a, a disfellowshipping some. What are you disfellowshipping them from? What? If we are supposed to, if we are supposed to show the character of God, how can we do the opposite of what God does? Yes. The more sinful you are, the more God's going to chase you down. I call God the hound of heaven. He'll hound you down no matter where you go. 
if we're supposed to resemble the character of God, and we're supposed, then we're supposed as church, we are, remember, we are the hands and feet of God. We're supposed to do what God does, not the opposite of what God does. And it says, exhort one another daily. Is not have the pastor exhort each person individually daily. It says, exhort one what? One another. Exhort one another. Teach one another. Love one another. Help one another. Pray for one another. How did they do this? These are things that don't happen in this service right here. If this is all we're going to continue doing, people, if this is all we're going to be doing, meeting on Saturdays and doing this, we will not grow where God wants us to grow. It's not going to happen. Because our church service Sabbath is such a large group, it, 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 it would not result in what happens. These things happen in, in small groups where people come to know each other. In other words, we must create more cliques. <laughs> and people say, wow, that's a negative fact. No, let me tell you something. Don't you all have a group of friends that you know each other, you get together, you feel comfortable with, and you do that? And, and, and you know, a lot of people say, well, Pastor, we got so What's wrong with that? Why don't you create your own clique? Okay? The reason you say is because you, you, don't, you don't reach out to people. You don't come to people. You don't, and, and you know what? And how do we create these things? We create these things with people we have something in common with. Maybe it's a profession, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But the thing is, you see people and, and there's nothing wrong with you finding a group of people that you feel comfortable with, that you can pray for each other, that you can love each other, that you have similar experiences that you can share with. That you can call up at any time and say, can you pray for me? Yeah, don't you all have that person here in church? A friend or whatever you say, that you feel comfortable saying, can you pray for me? I'm going through this. This is essential for church. Let me tell you something what the, what the, what the early church did. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Acts chapter 5, verse 42 tells us exactly how and why the Christian church grew the way that it grew. It says, and daily. <laughs> Do you hear that? Can you say that, people? Daily. 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 Okay? Daily. And daily. In the temple. And in every what? House. They did not cease teaching. And preaching Jesus as the Christ. Where? In the temple and where? And in every house. And in every house. It was a balance of the two. They came to the temple. And when we come to the, to the temple people, the temple is a place where we come to celebrate. To give information of what's going on generally in the church and to celebrate and to preach the word of God. But where, where people come together and they pray for each other eh, and they give the testimonies. We do the garden of prayer and we have requests and we care for each other and we talk to each other and we, and we do these things. Where, where let, let me tell you, a lot of these groups, the way they do, they make a covenant. When they come together, these cell groups, it doesn't matter how big the church 
churches, they make a covenant. They say, whatever happens here stays here. Whatever we talk about stays here. And they come to create this environment of comfortability where people are able to talk their biggest secrets where people will be able to share with one another. And they pray for each other. And they grow spiritually. And they help each other. And they come together as small groups. See, people, when that happens during the week, when you come to church, you really come to celebrate. Yes. Yes. This is how the early church grew. The idea of coming together like we do to worship once a week where we come together, it, it isn't personal. It, it, you know, it's preparing a program. But nothing personal really happens. Let me tell you what are things that happen in these small groups. What do what small groups offer? They offer a place to connect. How many people can you say that you really know in this church? How many people do you really know? Know their story know what's going on in their lives how many do you know in small groups people connect first corinthians chapter 9 verse 22 says to the weak i became weak that i may win the weak i have become all things to all men that i might by all means save some Paul sympathized with people. And a lot of times we don't sympathize with people because we don't know what's going on in their lives. We don't know how they got to where they got to. We don't know what's going on. And, and, and a lot of times we, we feel like we're the only ones going through things. We try to create common ground between each other to be there for each other and, and, and to help each other. We connect to people with people's back, background, pain, and personal experience. We must be able to connect with those things. So one of the things that, that happens in a small cell group is connection happens. You connect with a group. The idea that you're going to connect with a whole congregation is not realistic. You're going to be able to connect with a few people. You're going to be able to connect with a group. So in a small group, you're able to connect to people. Also, it is a place to protect. To protect. We protect each other. We don't tear down each other we protect each other first john chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 says by this we know by this we know love because he day laid down his life for us and we also listen to this and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? If we see our brother's needs and we shut ourselves up to that person, how does the love of God, how can we say that the love of God abides in us? But most of the time, by you just going to church, you don't know what people are going through. In these small cell groups, you're able to know what people are going through. You're able to share with other people what you're going through. You're able to come close to each other. Also, small cell groups is a place to grow. It is a place to grow spiritually. In Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, 
so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Spirituality was never meant to be lived out by ourselves. You know, when we a lot of times, remember a while back, I was in, a, in another church. And uh, <clears throat> many years ago, we were having you know prayer meeting Wednesday night. And um, everybody would stand up and give this powerful testimonies, you know. And, and one night I said, I said, you know what? I said, I would love to one night have somebody raise their hand and say, life is really bad for me. <laughs> I am really upset. I, I, I'm going through, you know, and just hear something negative. Because the thing is that a lot of times, you know, we, we, we feel like we have to act like these heroes that everything is good for us and everything. And no, we all have tough times, but we feel that when we meet in a, as a church, as a people, we can only talk about all these good things that are happening to us and not be able to say, you know what? I am in pain. I am suffering. I am going through a difficulty. In fact, right now, I am having trouble with God. hear that okay <laughs> says i am having trouble with god right now this this sincerity in our spiritual life is something that will help us grow spiritually like you've heard me say before you can never reach spirituality until you first confront reality We must be real. We must be real with ourselves. We must be real with others. And when you do that, you're going to find other people are real. And, 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 the, and the thing is, people, we, we, we have to know that as a Christian, we go, through, we go through highs and we go through lows. And we go through questions and we go through doubt and we go through, we go through all these things. And the thing, if, if those are never talked about, if those are never brought out, if those, if we don't get to hear somebody else's story, if we don't get to hear somebody else's perspective. One time, someone was telling me about, uh, Negro spirituals and how, you know, Negro spirituals came out and, and why uh, black churches worship the way that they did. You know, how uh, the, the rhythm and how all of this was and, and why was it that they, that they worship that way? I said, uh, imagine having a week where you got whipped, where they treated you like an animal, where you saw your child in front of you getting whipped and you couldn't do anything about it. But then now on the weekend you had to go worship God. Imagine the emotions within you to still be able to worship God. You see, their worship came out of an experience. Came out of an experience. And that person said, oh, I see, because you see, sometimes you don't know the story. And inside of each one of us, there's a story. And within each one of us, Jesus wants to save us within that story. But God has given to us each other. God has given us each other to be able to comfort each other comfort each other, to help us to grow spiritually each other. 
origin plans to become a, a church of groups. We must break out of this thing of just coming on Saturdays to church. And, and we will always have a church, you know, where people, there are, there are people who just want to come and, and, and they really don't want to get involved in something, in, in small groups. But we want our church to become a church of cell groups. And, and not this week, we're going to plan, we're going to plan it next week. We're starting a, um, and then we'll be starting next Monday, not this one, next Monday, we're going we're gonna to start. And we're going to start with a Bible study called Rooted. It's an amazing Bible study. And I invite you to join our groups. I invite you to, to join a group. I, I invite you to join a cell group where, where we can come together and meet once a week. And study the word of God together and pray for each other and, and, and meet in different homes. We're going to be meeting in different homes. And next week, we're going to put here the address of the different homes we're going to be uh, meeting at. Um, we're going to be meeting at, at the Joan Jones home. Uh, Carl also at Down South. Uh, also, uh, Sagithia's home is, is going to be um, another one. And if, if we have too many people, we'll create more homes. But this is essential, people, for our church growth to happen, for church growth, for our spiritual growth. We have to change the idea of just going to church once a week and just coming to listen to a praise team and not knowing each other and not knowing, knowing what's going on with each other and not having the opportunity to, to grow spiritually and to learn the word of God and to ask questions and to, and to explain our struggles one to another. This is how the early church did it. And this is how they grew. And this is how they became the largest movement in history. Not by coming together, everybody, but by getting together in small cell groups. And I, I, I invite you to, to pray about this. Because I know some people say, well, I can't, you know, I, I barely make it to church already on Saturday. And I know that most, some of you barely make it. I know that. <laughs> but, but to take out one day a week to say, I need to come together with my brothers and sisters and invite a neighbor and invite somebody and bring them in. And you know what, people? We're going to start with about four groups. But out of those four groups, when one of you have gone through it, Carl is going to be teaching a, a class in there. I'm going to be teaching. And you're going to be saying, you know what? There's somebody who really gets it. You're going to do this again, and you're going to do this in your home. And hopefully within about two years, we will have 30 or 40 groups going. And 30 or 40 different homes. I want you to know, people, that when that happens, worship here on Saturday will be nothing compared to what's going to, what you're going to experience in those groups. It's going to take a while for you to learn how it works because, because most of you have never been taught that it's okay to open up. But soon you will learn what it is to really have, to really call somebody a brother or a sister. So you will learn what a real brother is. We say, hey, brother, how you doing? Hey, he's not your brother, man. Guys never even talk. You will learn what it really means to do that. 
You will really learn what it, have, what it is to have a support group, people who will pray for you at every single instant, every single problem that you have, people that you can call at any time at night, and people, you can, people who can know your story and will love you the way that you are. You know, a while back I made a mistake. Yeah, there was, it's, it's, just, it's just like one time I, I was wrong. Okay. I would I would go and I would see these large churches, right? You know the large mega churches, right? And I would say, oh, man, these people, I don't know. It's like they go there and uh people gonna walk in with the little Starbucks, you know, and they sit down and they watch this guy. And I and I would say why is it that these people go to this? A lot of time, like if you go to one of the churches here in town, it's on, it's on a big screen. And I was like, well, why would people go somewhere to watch somebody on a screen? And a lot of you have had an experience that you've gone and you say, I'm not going to go watch somebody on a screen. Right? But then you see a thousand people go anyway. And you're going, why is that? Okay, so... To me, what I did was I went and I joined and I started going. My wife and I was like going to this group. You see, what happens at these churches is that the real church members, the real ones, all week they're going to small cell groups. And they're growing spiritually there. That's where it happens. Of course, you have a lot of people who just go to church and whatever because church is an event to them. But, but the, the, the greater of them, the, the, the heart of the church, they get together during the week in small cell groups. And they're studying the word of God together. So the idea, oh, nothing's happening in these churches. Oh, they're not growing. Spirit. Oh, nothing is happening. That's not true. It's not true because you don't, you're not part of it. And you're, you're, you're one of those that just goes. But they have groups for married couples. They have groups for the young kids of every single age. They have groups for young adults. They have groups for, for marriages that are struggling. They have groups for people that are dealing with some mental issues. They have groups for, for just spiritual growth, for discipleship. They have, they, they, have, they, 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 they have all kinds of different groups that meet everybody's different needs. And this goes on all the time. And these people are attending it. So that's why these people, they have no problem Sunday going on and worshiping and celebrating. Why? Because, because that big service is not, is not where they're getting everything. They're getting everything in small groups. That's where they're growing. That's where they're coming together. That's where it's happening. And um, it is something that we need to start doing as a church. We need to start growing as a church. I'm not happy as your pastor with just coming here Saturdays and staying the same. You either grow or you die. And if you don't die, but you don't grow for too long, you're just sick. But God calls us to more than that. I invite you to be part of this. I invite you to experience this. I invite you to, to pray about it. And as we start in a week, I wish all of you could join a group so that we can become like the early church. Like the early church. And that our church can grow and become everything that God wants it to be. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for your blessings. 
we thank you for allowing us to come together and to, and to study and to be part of your church and to love each other. But Lord, you call us to more than that. You call us to grow. You call us to be the church. You call us to love each other. You call us, Lord, to, to come closer to each other each time. You call us to, to learn each other's story and to see where every person is and to have compassion and sympathy for each person here. That we may be able to help each other get to heaven. That we may love each other as you loved us and as you love us. Bless us, Lord, and help us to become the church that you want us to be. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. That was an amazing message, wasn't it? Amazing message. Thank you so much for that. I just have a few announcements for, for us today. First and foremost, I want to invite you to stick around for lunch where we can uh, fellowship and hang out with each other. We are having lunch this afternoon. But before I break, I just want to give you three um, really important reminders. The singles retreat that the singles ministry has organized is coming up very quickly. It's going to be next week on the 9th. So from the 9th through the 11th, Merva has organized a singles retreat. I forget the camp that they're going to be going to. But if you are interested in uh, getting involved and participating uh, in the singles ministry event, see Merva, who is right there. And you can register for it at originchurch.com forward slash retreat originchurch.com forward slash retreat you can just go to that link and you can be able to register for um, the uh, retreat coming up after that we have the vacation bible school you guys know that that's an event that uh, we're doing in collaboration with blueprints church which is the church that um, that rents from us here and they are going to be organizing this vacation Bible school. It's an event for small kids that are gonna be five years old to 12 years old. It will take place for one week and it's gonna take place from June 26th to, through June 30th. June 26th through the 30th from 8 a.m. until 12 noon. I just sent out a link. I just sent out a link that you should have received by text message um, that you can click on that link and it'll take you to the registration page for you to register your child for Vacation Bible School. If you did not receive that link, that may mean that I don't have your contact information in our system. So I'm gonna invite you to do me a huge favor. You can use this little card that is in front of you. You can look in the, uh, in the seat in front of you. There's a little card, a connection card, and you can point your camera on the side that says here. connect, and that would allow you to register for our uh, alerts. That way you can keep up with the different events and things that are going on throughout the week and you can receive updates and different uh, things that are going on. If you don't want to use the card, you could also just visit originchurch.com forward slash connect. Originchurch.com forward slash connect and that would allow you to register as well for our alerts. The next big event that I want to mention is our health fair, which is coming up July 15th. We encourage everyone to participate, particularly if you are a health professional. We definitely need your involvement if you're a health professional for the health fair. It's gonna take place from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. We're gonna be out on the front yard. We're gonna have a, a big tent. There's gonna be, uh, I forget how many booths, but um, there are gonna be a lot of booths. I think 15 booths, Pastor, was it 15 or 12? 12 booths? More, more than that, but I think it's in the 20s possibly in the 20s, rendering a variety of different services to the community. We're going to be promoting this very heavily within our community here and inviting people to come out and get free health services. Uh, and so, um, again, this is something you can register for as well to indicate you want to participate. You can go to originchurch.com forward slash health fair. Originchurch.com forward slash health fair. If you are a health care professional, we definitely invite you to participate. Of course, you guys know that there are a series of different things going on throughout the week. I'm not going to go down the list. 
I want to encourage you to subscribe for our alerts. That way I can just send out a notification and let you know what's coming up. You can always stay updated on all the different things that are taking place, the different Bible studies, the different special events, the different get-togethers. Everything that we're doing, we're sending out alerts. And if you're not receiving them, either by email or by text message, that may mean that I don't have your contact information. Please provide that for me, and I'll be more than happy to, to keep you posted on everything that's going on. I hope you guys had a wonderful uh, worship service this afternoon, and you have a wonderful time hanging out at lunch. You got one more thing, Pastor? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, being a family and knowing each other. And, um, you know, you all know we've been praying for my wife's sister, Denise. Um, and it's only been two weeks that all of a sudden she discovers she has cancer. And um, then this week, uh, from the place that she's at, you know, they let her daughter Esther know. Peggy knows Esther was she she was Esther's teacher. Um, they know they let her know Thursday that there was really nothing that could be done. Um, you know, we're like, hey, uh, you know, as I, you know, like I told him, I said, hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving up. And I'm not giving up. Um, you know, it's just very special to my mom, uh, to my wife, is her oldest sister. And she probably spent more time with her older sister than she did with her mom. Her older sister was like a mom to them. My wife's mom, she she passed away like 17 years ago of of uh, liver cancer, also. And uh, then about two weeks ago, my sister-in-law just from one day went to the hospital. She didn't know what it was; just had some pain, and right there, boom, discovered she's got cancer, lungs, stomach, and liver. So we sent her a place, and they said, you know, there was nothing. And now, you know, we, we you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like to give up about stuff. And so her husband went to see her and spent some time with her over there. And, and then uh, their daughter just sent my wife a text. It says, you know, the reception from there was, phone reception was really bad, but uh, talking about her dad, he said, but he began to cry and said she was swollen and that she was sick. I think he just recently sunk in that she is sick to him. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, and I just wanted to pray with you guys. Is that okay? I just want to pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I ask you I am begging you, Lord. I'm begging you to please act in the behalf of Denise you know what she's going through and I know that you're the all powerful God and there's nothing there's nothing impossible for you and I beg you Lord in the name of Jesus to Lord touch every cell of her body to impact every cell of her body from the top of her head to her toes, Lord. You can do this. You can bring healing upon her, Lord. You know the life that she has lived for you. And I ask you, Lord, and please do a miracle in her life. I know that you can cleanse her. I know you can take this away. And I ask you, Lord, 
ask you, Lord, for healing. That you may heal her, Lord, that you may heal her body, that you may take this cancer away. I know that you can do it. There's nothing impossible for you. Why don't we ask you? Not because we deserve anything from you, Lord, but because you're, you love her. You love her, Lord. And we ask you to move, to move in her behalf. Help my wife, Lord, as she goes through this. Give Esther her daughter strength and her husband Caesar. Give them strength, Lord, in this moment. They need you so bad. And we as a church are coming to you, begging you, Lord, please. Please, Lord, we need you. We need you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen.